it's a really busy time of year now. We're all hastily starting to sow our vegetable seeds. Now, when I started studying my horticultural degree at Reading University some 50 years ago, it was much easier to choose what varieties to grow. But now, when I open the seed catalogues, there are thousands, thousands and thousands of different varieties, new ones flooding the market every year. And I think starting with the choice of variety of seed to grow is one of the most crucial things for success with vegetables. And so what I've done is I've just gathered together a few top tips for growing what I think are really good varieties. And if you had problems last year with the droughts and the weather problems, then maybe this will help you. Now, first of all, when you're choosing your seed suppliers, I do choose a range of them, but I do have a lot from Tozer Seeds. Now, as you'll see, these packets from Tozer Seeds are big. Uh, this is quite a small one. This is an even bigger one because they are commercial seed producers. So if you are growing for a market garden or for a selling and you rely on your livelihood of vegetable production, you need really good seeds. And the commercial sellers are off, obviously pretty good. Not only do they, if they don't, they would go out of business if they didn't so, supply really good seeds, but also you know that they haven't been sitting on a garden, a garden centre display stand for maybe six months, maybe a year, and actually aren't particularly fresh. Now, toes of seeds, you'll see there are quite a few packets of these, but these they do supply them to people like King Seeds, Fothergills, Suffolk Herbs, and the like. Um, but and they will all be that obviously the varieties grown by Toza if, if they are these varieties here. Now, um, one of the first things that people wonder about is F1 seeds as opposed to ordinary open pollinated seeds. Now, F1 seeds are more expensive, but they are genetically identical. So, if I sow a packet of these parsnip gladiator, um, which are an F1 seed. I know they will have hybrid vigor. I know, which means they'll be much, much um, more vigorous plants. And I know they will all be good. Recently, with quite a few varieties that aren't F1, that are open pollinated, you know, seed growers grow them in big fields. They're meant to rogue out the ones that don't look like the variety. Um, but obviously they do get cross-pollinated with other things and so slowly the variety can really decrease in its, its uniformity and it is, becomes quite different from what it was originally. So people who have grown certain vegetables for years suddenly find these are hopeless now. And it's not you, it is often the seed. Now I'm not saying that F1 are brilliant for everything, but for many things I think they are, and particularly parsnips, I think they've revolutionized parsnip growing. Um, now this is because parsnips, along with celery and carrot and parsley, their seeds are not always fully developed. The embryos are not fully developed in the seed when they're picked and sold for sowing. And so often they will take at least two weeks to germinate, maybe six weeks to germinate. So in that long time when they're sitting in the compost, they can rot, they can get hit by a pest, they can get scratched at by a rabbit, all sorts of things can happen to them. And so that means that you really are chancing it away a bit more. Whereas if you go for something like Gladiator, um, there's also Countess, it's an F1, but I like Gladiator, it means that you can actually delay sowing right until late May. And because it's such a vigorous variety, even if you sow it in late May, I'm lifting jolly nice big roots um, in the autumn. And then you can leave them in all through the winter and just pull them as you need them. Because as, you as I'm sure you know, parsnips are much better if they're frosted, they become sweeter. So when you sow these, you'll find that they will often germinate within two weeks if you leave it to late May because it's naturally warmer. Um, and so you have a, a much better chance. And also, they don't need nearly so much watering, even if it's dry because of the vigour. In a dry summer like last summer, you will still get stonking great roots. So that is probably my first one. That is that is parsnip gladiator. Uh, also, you could look for countess. Um, I've got a massive pack of hundreds of seeds here. Um, and so I'm going to do a few talks shortly and I will give them away to anyone who needs some. So that's number one. Number two. 
So this is Courgette Summer Holiday and it's also an F1 and I haven't been so keen on these gaudy coloured courgettes and this is a round yellow striped courgette in the past. In the past I found these yellowy courgettes not nearly as vigorous as the green one but this is a very good one and it's very good for drought conditions and so many people last year had courgettes that produced next to nothing as opposed to normally in England we have hundreds of them and we think what on earth can I do with this courgette now. Um, so I'm going to put in some of these this year. Uh, another courgette that I like very much, oh I forgot to mention this one is also nice and compact, it doesn't sprawl everywhere which is quite useful if you haven't got masses of space. Another green courgette that I love is Defender F1 um, and I will probably get some of that as well to pop in and I find nearly always they grow amazingly well and, and I really do love courgettes. So that's number two. Number three is this broccoli. Um, this is Claret F1, another F1, but you see obviously it's got bigger. I'm going to sow this in March. Um, I'll transplant it then into my veg. I'll sow in the modules like with everything, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then I'll transplant it in June out into the site. And I'll be picking this from next March to next June, hopefully. I mean, there's loads of broccoli out there and some of them aren't really very good at all. But Claret F1 is a great one. I love it. Broccoli is so easy. But with all brassicas, you will need to net this from pigeons and things. Pigeons and aphids. And if you aren't going to net it, it's hardly worth growing with many brassicas. So my next one is this salad onion and it's marksman. And I'm going to sow this one now, this weekend. Um, and then I'm going to sow them in modules like, like this one. I'll fill them with compost. It's got a few plants I must get out. I'll fill them with compost and I'll probably, because it's a salad onion, I'll put 10 seeds, little seeds per plug. I'll sow them now and then I'll transplant them um, in mid-March, end of March. And I'll have 10 little onion plants in one and I'll transplant the whole clump together. That way it's much quicker and then I'll pick a little bunch of spring onions. Obviously, um, with many plants, the wider the spacing you give it, the bigger the plant you get. But with something like a bunching onion, a spring onion, um, to have a nice little bunch of spring onions is lovely. But I also do that with my eight main crop onions as well. I will put in three, four, five, so in a little module, plant them out together, and they all, they all go pretty big. They are very tough things, onion. So um, uh, the, these, again, the reason I like this one, the reason I like Marksman is because it is really good in hot, dry conditions. Um, and I think now with global warming, we need to be really assessing how our vegetable varieties grow, cope with the heat. So that's that one. The next one is Cavallo Nero Raven. Now this is really interesting because we all started growing Cavallo Nero maybe 10 years ago because it's such a beautiful plant that looks lovely in the vegetable garden. And it's a really nice fresca to go in risottos and things like that. Um, but all the Cavallo Nero that we've grown in the UK has been come from Italy up to now, but this is the first one that's bred for growing in England. And as such, it doesn't bolt so much in our conditions. And also it's much hardier. So if I sow it, I'll probably sow it um, May to June in little plugs. Um, I'll then plant them out in lines. Um, and then I'll be picking this really from September through to Feb. So all those winter months, my vegetable garden is going to have this beautiful looking Cavallo Nero. Um, and I, I just would never be without it. So another one is Sima de Rapa. Um, now, this is really nice, I think. Well, it's really useful because it grows so fast. So I will sow it from April to August. It will be ready to pick maybe a couple of months after sowing. So it's a really rapid grower and you eat I pick the little flowery bits and I also pick the leaves as well. So you can use just about all of the plant. So it's a very useful filler. 
Um, it's not nearly as attractive as Cavallo de Nero, but it, it's great tasting. And we put it in pasta dishes, we put it in salads, we use it as a vegetable on its own, we shove it in stir fries. It, it's a great, great plant. And there's many, many different varieties do this Sima de Rapa. Um, this is one from Frankie. Um, and they, they are grow mainly in Italy, these seeds. But a lot of them are okay here. Now, this chili pepper is called quick fire and the reason it's called quick fire is because it is massively fast maturing and you can actually sow it at any time of year i mean if i sowed it in december outside in the greenhouse it wouldn't germinate but if i sowed it in december in the kitchen it would germinate and it would grow onto a plant um, and so I like to have chilli plants with lots of chillies on them on my windowsill in the kitchen in, at Christmas. And I also like them um, in the greenhouse and outside in the good summer. So because it's so fast maturing and it is fiery, a really fiery seed, I think this is definitely a great F1 chilli to grow. So don't forget this one. Brussels sprouts. Now Brussels sprouts have changed dramatically since when I started growing vegetables. Um, they are much sweeter. I think they're bred to be much sweeter, less Brussels sprout tasting because some people really hated them. Um, but I, I love Brussels sprouts anyone. But the, anyway, but this is a good sweet variety and it's got very early maturing um, sprouts on it. Now, because it's F1, it's obviously got the vigour. This is Brussels sprout Churchill. Um, and I will sow it now, this weekend coming up, and then I'll, I'll plant them out later on. And what they used to say, people always used to say on Gardener's Question Time, why aren't my Brussels sprouts firming up? Why are they just sort of all f uh, open and flowery? Um, and they, the answer always was, it's because you have not firmed the ground in enough around the plants when you plant them out. But that is rubbish, really. I mean, these F1 varieties, they do not want firming heavily. You're going to just compact and consolidate the soil, which is not good. Um, and at the, end of the, at the end of the growing season, I can just pull up my Brussels sprout plants just by my hand and then I throw it to the cows or whatever. Uh, and these will still develop nice, tight little sprouts if you don't firm them up. And please don't firm them up. So um, go for Churchill. Um, as you know, I don't know if you saw my Christmas decoration video, but we had Brussels sprouts all over the kitchen and I love looking at them and I love eating them and I enjoy growing them too. Um, spinach, Santa Cruz. Now this is interesting one. I love spinach um, and I nearly always every year will just go and or grow an ordinary perpetual spinach or a spinach beet and I find that much tougher it's much less prone to bolting than a normal spinach um, it's probably less spinachy tasting it's probably less bitter and often in a mild winter I can have it and be picking at it a bit all through the winter and then it bursts into growth in sort of March April and so you have lots of lovely foliage to use in that's what's called the hungry gap you know when you finish your winter veg before your lettuces and things come into being so I will sow an ordinary perpetual spinach which I'll just get from whoever or the spinach beet um, but I will also grow this one because this is a slow to bolt one and I'm going to sow it now and then I'll sow another picking in September. And apparently a good thing about Santa Cruz is you can use it as a little leaf or you can use it as a big mature leaf. Um, so if like Popeye you're a fan of spinach, definitely get that one. Um, Coal Rabbi is an interesting one. Um, I've grown different varieties of Coal Rabbi and Cossack F1 is just unbelievably better than all the rest. All the rest I have pretty miserable plants. With this one I have lovely literally this big sort of flying saucer type things um, and you might think what does that taste like but it's actually delicious. We use them over winter. Um, we, we leave them in the beds in a mild winter or maybe if it's cold we'll shove stuff over them when it's cold. 
um, to keep them okay. But then we just grate them or chop them up into tiny bits and dice them and put them into salads. Um, they are beautifully sweet, beautifully nutty. And I'll be sowing these in April and June in cells and then they'll go out probably May, end of May, something like that. So unusual looking and taste far nicer than they look. Or maybe you like the look of that anyway. Well, it's quite attractive, really. Depends what floats your boat. And it's something I try not to be without. So then we go into coriander calypso. And uh, most of us love coriander. Well, some of us hate the taste of it. There's a genetic thing that it tastes different to a small percentage of the population. But for those that don't hate it, they usually love it. And it's useful in salads and stir fries and curries and the like. Now, it always bolts. That is the problem with coriander. But calypso actually takes two weeks longer to bolt than its other than other varieties. But that's not the only plus point with calypso. Calypso has a very low growing point. And when you have cup and, get, cup and come again, like the salads and the coriander, if you cut them too low, you often remove the growing point. So if you've removed the growing point, then obviously it's not going to grow back. But Calypso has a much higher growing point. Um, so that means that, sorry, that Calypso has a much lower growing point. So it means that you tend not to cut the growing point out when you're cutting your Calypso for your stir fry or whatever. So that is a big, big plus. And it's something that people don't really realize with cut and come agains. If you go too low and cut the growing point out, you're not going to get any more. Um, so just be careful and watch that one. Um, now, I love cut and come again. I hardly ever do hearted salad now because I can sow from a couple of sowings of this year, I'll have enough lettuce to see me really 12 months of the year. But the problem with a lot of cut and come again mixes is they shove a load of different seeds in that germinate at different temperatures that mature at different times. That might be all the same type of leaf. But this one, which is from uh, Frankie again, Frankie Seeds, is the Tuscan salad mix. And it's got four types of leaf. It's got really a crunchy seed, a soft leaf, a ruffled leaf, um, and a romaine type leaf. Um, so for this chef, it works for me because I've got a nice variety of leaves to cut and also they all grow at similar temperatures and they all germinate at similar temperatures and times. So when you sow the lot you get the good mix coming up you don't just get one main protagonist in your mix and the rest just sit there taking ages to do anything and I think that is a key thing with any cut and come mix so that's one I really rate. So, sorry, this is going on a bit, isn't it? Super Marmand, that's if you like a beefsteak tomato, I think Super Marmand, and this is one from TNN, Topsom Organ, is one of the most reliable of the big beefsteak tomatoes to grow. A lot of them take a long time to form fruits in this climate in the greenhouse, but Super Marmand is probably the most reliable. My husband really adores them and always whinges if I don't get some beefsteak tomatoes in the ground. Um, so that's one I would definitely go for. Now, do bear in mind, something like that will never come as quickly, won't mature as quickly as a tomato like this, which is the Sun Gold F1. And Raymond Blanc, when I gave him some of these, he said it was just supreme, the balance of sweet and sour. It was just wonderful, he thought. Um, it, it flowers and fruits very early on. I should have sewn it now, but I'll be sewing it on the kitchen windowsill shortly. Um, and it goes on and on and on and on. And it's often in the greenhouse till December, till Christmas, looking pretty tatty, but still with some tomatoes on there. And as I hardly ever buy tomatoes, because I hate shop-bought tomatoes compared to homegrown, for me, it's invaluable to have this. And a tip with tomato growing, if you want them to get into fruit, early do not water them too much just be slow on the watering and that boosts them into fruit production um, cucumbers i always um, grow carmen carbon is a fabulous long cucumber is very mildew resistant um, and that's why i like it this is one from tnm um, and i will sow these indoors in a very warm position just by my arga um, which is probably 24, something like that, 28. They'll germinate in a couple of 
days usually and then I'll move them plant them up on the kitchen windowsill and then plant them out and I might well be getting fruits by May June so it's nice and early doing it that way um, they are really wonderful and the last one from the packets is the um, this one now I hope there's lots of people coming to my talk <laughs> loads of these seeds to give away now loads of people had lots of problems with runner beans last year because it was so hot they didn't actually um, have much success and the reason for that is because runner beans are very susceptible to high night temperatures and to drought French beans on the other hand are much better in those hot dry conditions that we had now this is moonlight and you see it is an unusual one because it is actually a cross between a French bean and a runner bean and it's got the taste of a runner bean which is quite distinct from a French bean but actually it will tolerate the heat and drought as a French bean does so that is why it's such a fantastic runner bean to have now this one i'll plant out well i'll sow them probably in march and i like to have mine planted out in um end of april mid april and i watch the weather and if it's going to be frosty i fleece them all up because i like them to get their roots down really well before the summer droughts and that really does help so um i will sow quite a few of this and then i'll sow another batch again in July so I've got them going later on in the season and with my runner beans I will all my beans and things I tend to sow them in instead of the little modules I'll sow them into these longer type modules um, because they've got a big root and with my broad beans and obviously when you sow them if you've got a mouse problem like most of us have nowadays I, I don't know if you can see this but I sow a lot of my seeds up on a sort of cantilevered arrangement very Heath Robinson but it means the mice can't get at them. Otherwise, if, you sow, if I sowed them on the ground, I'll come back within 24 hours, 48 hours, and I'll see little bits of crunched up beans on the surface, little holes in all the tops, and I'll see the odd bean popping out of a rose plant or something like that, where they've eaten half of it or moved it somewhere else. Heaven knows why. Perhaps to come back for later. So that is um, a, a, t a good tip with beans. A, a lot of crops, I find the mouse mice are eating loads of so what haven't we covered there's lots of things we haven't covered but basically i just thought a few tips so if we have a dry summer i do think it's worth watering your vegetables in well and mulching them and that does help keep the moisture in always be careful though that you don't overwater crops because if you overwater and that's tomatoes in the greenhouse cucumbers things outside whatever then the flavour dilutes and they don't taste nearly so sweet and they're not so nutritious either. So it, don't waste the water. And when you overwater a root crop, such as your parsnips, and those parsnips need hardly any watering anyway, the F11 ones, then you get lots of leafy top growth, but you don't get much root and you want the root. So don't be generous with the water. We don't have mains water here. We just get it from the spring. So I'm really mean with watering, but I still get really good crops. And I don't fertilise either. I don't fertilise any of my veg. I just add my mulch. I've been doing it these last weekends. Um, and I keep the soil nice and healthy, but I don't fertilise the plants. I want them to grow slowly. More, I want them to grow more slowly uh, and I want them to have great flavour. Um, and I'm a firm believer in that. Um, and then the other thing that we're always asked is sowing temperatures. Now, I use a chart um, which is actually from um, the, the United States of America and some research institute there have actually worked out the optimum temperature for all seed sowings. And you can see that because any plant that germinates first will be the healthiest and the strongest. And though, so therefore you want to give them the ideal conditions so they all germinate quite quickly. If they take weeks to germinate and much slower than the others, then they will always be weak plants and they will never catch up. So I try and give them the optimum conditions. So I sow some on a heated mat. I sow some in the kitchen window cell. I sow some in here. Just depends what their optimum range is. And I try and get that as close as possible. Um, and that I think is really important. Now, the other thing, well, this is one of my favorite books, Know and Grow Vegetables, 
for slaughter and Beesdale. Now I regularly spoke to John Beesdale. He was great. Unfortunately, he's passed away now. But they work for the Vegetable Research Institute, and this book, which is very difficult to get. Um, uh, is actually full of the research that they did over years um, at the National research, Vegetable Research Institute. And what it's got in here, which I find quite useful, is it tells you how long seeds last. Um, because if I don't find people who want some of my seeds, um, I'm going to have to uh, going to have a lot of seeds for next year. And I will also put this chart up because it does tell you. But some seeds will last up to 10 years in an unsealed container in a normally heated room and those are things like tomato and radish up to nine years cabbage sweet and turnip up to six years carrot and cauliflower and up to three years they reckon lettuce leek onion and parsnip um, so there's that little chart there so I hope you have a great year with your seeds we you'll probably get one or two failures it's it's not uncommon um, because every year we get different so weather conditions thrown at us um, but hopefully if you choose the right variety of seed give them the temperatures they want protect them from any pests particularly the brassicas you should be spot on and have some fabulous crops to enjoy this year <laughs>